Okay, so I guess we will start. Uh, we are very happy and I'm really glad, looking forward to this talk, to hear uh, Peter Borton from Texas, who will talk about a uh, flexible stability and non-sophisticity. Yeah. So it, is it yours, Peter? So thanks everybody for logging on. So um, what I'll talk about today is uh, some topics related to uh, SOFIC groups, which um, sort of fit in the theme with the seminar about finite finite testability for infinitary properties. And this is all joint work with Lewis Bowen. Okay, so the basic idea we're trying to study is this concept of a SOFIC group. So a SOFIC group is one which admits a certain structure called a SOFIC approximation. An asophic approximation is a sequence of finitary models for the group, or maybe more accurately, it's a sequence of finitary models for the left translation action of the group on itself. So this sophic approximation is supposed to be something that is approximately an action and approximately replicating the group. So the way it works is we have this sequence of finite sets, which we're calling Vn. And a priori, these are just unstructured finite sets. Um, and you should think that the size of Vn increases to infinity with n. And then for each one of these finite sets, we have some map which takes every element of the group to a permutation of the set. And I'll just emphasize that at this point, you know, we have a function between two groups and we are not assuming this is a group homomorphism. It's just saying for every element of the group, we have some permutation of the set. And then the group homomorphism property is supposed to hold in an asymptotic sense. So you can see we have this asymptotic homomorphism property where if you fix a pair of group elements and look at the permutations they represent at the different stages of this approximation, eventually, for any fixed pair of group elements, pretty much all the points, it's acting like a homomorphism. So we have these elements V in our finite set, which for reasons that will become clear later on, we'll refer to as vertexes. So we can think of Vn as a vertex set. And this asymptotic homomorphism condition is saying that if I pick a high stage in my sophic approximation, pretty much all of the vertices, this pair of elements looks like a homomorphism. So I'll just emphasize that you fix the pair of group elements, and then you have to decide how far you need to go to get them to look at a homomorphism on most of the set. So if I pick my favorite set of a million group elements. For that set of a million, I can find some stage where they're all going to look roughly like a homomorphism. But if I pick a larger set of group elements where I want them to look like a homomorphism, I may, might need to pick a larger stage in the Sophic approximation. And then the way we're saying that this sort of actually models the group or models the left translation action of the group is that it has a vanishing number of fixed points. So if you have an element of the group which is different from the identity, then the number of fixed points for that element goes to zero as the stage of the approximation goes to infinity. So this object, we call a sophic approximation. 
and it's more or less supposed to be a finitary approximation to the left translation action of the group on itself. Okay, so there's two fundamental examples of um, sophic groups. And the definition of sophicity is more or less designed to be a common generalization of these two examples. So the first example we want to think about is G is a countable amenable group. So you have a Fulner sequence in the group, which is a sequence of finite sets, which are approximately invariant under translation by a fixed group element. So we'll call these sets Fn. And the property we want for these sets Fn is that if I fix a group element, then when n is large, pretty much the entirety of GFN overlaps with Fn. So you're translating Fn by G, and it's mostly staying within itself. So the basic examples of countable of, of, of Fulmer sequences are, you know, in um, uh, the finitely generated abelian groups, just a large ball or a large cube forms a Fulner sequence. So if you think about z squared and you take some gigantic disk around the origin and look at all the integer points in that disk, when you translate the disk by one, it will mostly overlap with itself. And the same will be true of the integer points in the disk along with its translation by one. So that's an example where G is Z squared and where the group G is Z squared and the element G is just translation by one. But the idea is you have this approximately invariant sequence of sets in your amenable group. And you can turn this into a sophic approximation just by saying, well, okay, if I try and translate this thing Fn by G, most of the time that translation is going to end up within my set. So I'm just going to say, most of the time I'll let the sophic approximation act by less left translation. And then I have these few annoying elements where left translation is going to fall outside my set. But for those elements, I'm just going to define it arbitrarily. And because the overlap between G inverse Fn and Fn is a large proportion of Fn, we get the sophic approximation conditions because this bad set where we defined it arbitrarily is a vanishingly small proportion of the total. And then the second example we want to think about is a residually finite group. So if you have a residually finite group and you have a decreasing sequence of finite index subgroups with trivial intersection, you can just take this finite set Vn to be G mod one of these finite index subgroups. And in that case, you can define the sophic approximation just to be left translation on the coset space. So in that case, the asymptotic homomorphism property is satisfied exactly. So for the residually finite case, the maps sigma n are precisely group homomorphisms. And we don't have this. Um, I'll just go back to the previous slide. We see for the definition of sophicity, we have this asymptotic homomorphism property. and when we're dealing with amenable groups, we do need the asymptotic part. But when we're dealing with residually finite groups, we just get that property exactly even at every finite stage. So these are the two basic examples of sophic groups. And in recent years, there's been a very rich sophic, 
theory of Sophic groups, which has developed, um, I guess, um, in, in my personal experience has mostly been in the context of ergodic theory, where it seems that entropy theory originated for actions of the integers and by the late 1980s, it was pretty well developed for actions of amenable groups. But in the past 10 years, entropy theory for sophic groups has really proved to be very fruitful. And so there's a lot of things that people know about sophic groups. And so this raises the natural question of whether every countable discrete group is sophic. And so, um, Obviously, it would be great if this was true, because then all these things we know about sophic groups would be true about countable discrete groups in general, but it's widely believed that there should be a group which is not sophic. So, um, you know, it, um, it would be pretty spectacular if every group were sophic, but people don't think that should be true. Okay, so the concept we want to focus on in this lecture is what we're going to call um, a perfect sophic approximation. So we'll just say the sophic approximation is perfect if each sigma n is a genuine group homomorphism. So this asymptotic homomorphism property is satisfied exactly at every finite stage and we don't have any of these potentially small error sets where things fail to look like a group homomorphism. So um, we have this uh, idea of a perfect approximation, which is just where we have a genuine group homomorphism and none of these errors where sigma g sigma h is different from sigma g h. And so if we have a finite generating set for our group, we'll call it S, we can endow the vertex set of the sophic approximation with the structure of a labeled directed graph um, by doing basically the same thing you do as, for Cayley graphs. You just put a uh, edge from each vertex to the image of that vertex under the labeled generator. And um, this gives a well-defined directed graph structure on an arbitrary sophic approximation, which is why I started off calling the VN vertex sets. But it, it has a particularly nice interpretation when sigma is a perfect sophic approximation because in that con when sigma is a perfect sophic approximation each set vn is a schreier graph on the cosets of a finite index subgroup of g or at least each connected component is a schreier graph on the cosets of a finite index subgroup and so the concept that we're dealing with is what we call stability or flexible stability, which is when we say that every sophic approximation is essentially equivalent to a perfect sophic approximation. So some group has all these sophic approximations and you can always modify a sophic approximation by changing one edge at each stage because changing one edge at each stage will vanish in the limit. So more or less the concept of stability is that everything is a perfect sophic approximation up to making a vanishingly small change. And so this definition we have here is a precise form of what we mean by a vanishingly small change between two sophic approximations. So if we have two sophic approximations which are living on the same vertex set, then what we're going to say is that they're at edit distance zero if they agree on an 
they agree except on a vanishingly small error. So sigma and psi are at, at a distance zero if they're corresponding labeled graphs um, agree in increasingly large proportions of the vertices for each fixed group element. And then if we have um, two uh, vertex, if we have a, another situation where we're saying the vertex set of the thing we're comparing sigma with might be different from the vertex set of sigma, we can just sort of modify the definition a little bit to say that, well, okay, these things are conjugate. If I can map them injectively into a larger Sophic approximation where they become at edit distance zero. So basically the idea is that you have these vertex sets Vn and you have these vertex sets Wn and I can just add a few extra vertices to get these things to agree except on a vanishingly small error. And so when you're dealing with Sophic approximations, you always have this freedom to kind of manipulate vanishingly small errors however you want, because none of the theory, the, the whole point of the theory is that the errors which vanish in the limit can be ignored for arguments that actually use the concept. So we say that this definition is formalizing the idea of two Sophic approximations, which are essentially the same because the disagreements between these two approximations vanish in the limit. And for the theory of Sophic groups, things which vanish in the limit just don't matter. Okay. So um, we're going to say that a surface group is flexibly stable if every Sophic group, if every Sophic approximation to the group is conjugate to a perfect Sophic approximation. So a group is flexibly stable if pretty much every, um, a, a, a group is flexibly stable if pretty much every Sophic approximation is conjugate to, it comes from a perfect Sophic approximation. And so we can look at um, free groups and we can say it's pretty obvious that free groups are flexibly stable because a Sophic approximation to a free group is just um, going to have some small errors, but because the group is free, you can repair those errors however you want, and it doesn't interfere with anything because, well, you know, constructing a homomorphism out of a free group is pretty easy. So if you have a Sophic approximation for a free group and you want to turn it into a perfect one, all you have to do is just edit each of the free generators on a small set to turn it into a full permutation. And that gives you a homomorphism because it's a free group. So um, the theorem that um, so, 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 so in terms of um, theorems about flexible stability, there's a theorem from 2019 by Lavar Lazarvich, Levin, and Minsky, which says that surface groups are flexibly stable. So this was the um, first theorem where we kind of got a really non-trivial example of a flexibly stable group. And then there's a more recent theorem by um, Ioana from this year, which says that the direct product of the rank two free groups is not flexibly stable. So um, there's something about this kind of forcing commutativity between non-abelian free groups that is an obstruction to flexible stability. So there's another concept which we'll call strict stability, which is basically when you want to 
transform every Sophic approximation into a perfect Sophic approximation without adding extra vertices. So it's like you need to edit the edges in this graph to turn it into a Schreier graph, but you're not allowed to add some additional vertices. And in this context, um, there's a theorem of Arjanseva and Paunescu from 2015 that finitely generated abelian groups are strictly stable. And then there's a negative result by Becker and Lubotsky from 2018 that no infinite property T group is strictly stable. So um, this kind of strict stability is, well, like the name suggested, it's a more rigid thing than flexible stability. Okay, so our main result is that if PSLD is flexibly stable for some D greater than or equal to five, then there exists a group which is not sophic. So before I go on to discuss the theorem in greater detail, I'll just pause and see if anyone has questions about, you know, the statement of the theorem or um, the initial concepts we've introduced so far. I have just like a, a general question about the statement of this theorem. How um, how sensitive is it that it's actually PSLDZ uh, and not say SLD or GLD or congruent subgroup? Like how oh. how much does it matter if we yeah, shift the, the index? The um the PSL the the projective part is just for our convenience, it just makes it a little bit easier to work with PSL rather than SLD. Um, G GLD would work fine as well. Um, the, it's um, just basically what we need is we need to have uh, the subgroup structure of SLDZ. So we need like the congruent subgroup property and certain information about quotients, uh, about special linear groups over finite fields and stuff like that. Thanks. I have a question. Sure. Um, since I don't have much intuition, uh, you have A implies B. How much do I believe A? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, um, that's obviously kind of a essential question here. I, so, so Lewis Bowen and I have discussed this a lot and we have, I don't know, we, we have a general idea of why PSLD should be flexibly stable. There's a very geometric intuition for why this should be true. And Sophic approximations can be interpreted for, if, if the group you're dealing with has geometric structure, Sophic approximations often have geometric interpretations. So if we go back to the theorem about surfic groups being flexibly stable, the way that theorem works is it really does actually involve the geometry of surfaces and you um, sort of uh, look at surfaces as manifolds and then you can get quantitative relationships between the cardinalities of subsets of these discrete sophic groups and things like areas in the surfaces you're dealing with. So if we go back to our theorem, um, you know, obviously PSLD has a lot of structure and we can look at um, something like quotients of PSLR by discrete subgroups. So if we look at a quotient of PSLR by a finite index subgroup of PSLZ, those manifolds are very relevant to flexible stability of PSLDZ. And so 
Lewis and I believe that by conducting a kind of geometric analysis of what SOFIC approximations look like for PSLD, it should be possible to prove that this is flexibly stable, but I'll, cap I'll, I'll, I'll put in a disclaimer that that would be a very, very long and complicated argument to successfully complete that program, but we do have an idea of why this should be true. And in terms of analogies, um, it's known that similar things are true in a linear context for related groups. So you can, I, I, I'm not sure whether this has been discussed in the this seminar before, but you can ask questions about like analogs of flexible stability for homomorphisms into finite dimensional unitary groups. And there are positive results in, in that context. So uh, I, I, I can add you, I, I was about to say, um, uh, uh, probably, I mean, I, I am going to follow your lecture very carefully, but the impression I got from your paper that there is a good chance that what you proved for a PSL DZ would apply to more general Iran lattices. Yes, and yes. Some Iran lattices, not including SLDZ, we know stability in the unitary group with respect to some metrics. So this is not, <laughs> this is far from proving even that, but at least it's a kind of another motivation to to believe that there is some stability around. Yeah, yeah, and um, I'll just point uh, out- um, You've answered my question, you believe A. <laughs> yes, <laughs> well, uh, you know- There's also- given, so the theorem, given the theorem, I have a vested interest in believing A, right, so- <laughs> that, But now, uh, I think you've answered it. Uh, uh, sure, yeah. Okay, so so anyways, I'll, I'll, I'll go on to start talking a little bit. About... I, I think Alon wanted to ask something, Alon. I... Oh, uh, I just wanted to mention that um, maybe in the more pessimistic side, um, I think Joanna proved also this year that, okay, not SLVZ, but um, like the affine group, the two SL2Z cross Z2, uh, it is not... Um, flexibly Hilbert Schmidt stable. So maybe this is a bit discouraging, yeah. but uh, it's not, not the... Um... Yeah, you know, my intuition studying this kind of stuff have always been that direct products are somehow just extremely, like a direct product structure is an extremely rigid thing for this kind of theory. Like it's very, very hard to get a direct product structure reflected in these finite models. I, I, I This is way off topic, but I think the recent disproof of Kahn's embedding conjecture is in some sense a uh, an illustration of that, but yeah, direct products are, are very, very hard for this kind of theory to deal with. Um, Peter, if you could uh, elaborate on this point, maybe after the talk, I would be interested. Yeah, sure, I'll, 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 I'll be happy to do that. So, so, so just, just remind me that at the end and I'll, 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 I'll discuss it in, in more detail. Um, so, so yeah, so, 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 so what does this group look like that at least has a potential to not be sophic? Well, um, so there's a general construction in the theory of discrete groups called the HNN extension. And the idea of an HNN extension is basically that you have an isomorphism between two subgroups and you want to turn that isomorphism into an inner isomorphism. So um, what you do is you add this additional generator, which at the start is simply a free product. And then you quotient out by exactly what you need to make this additional generator implement an inner automorphism 
between A and B. So you quotient by the subgroup consisting of everything that you would expect if this generator T were implementing phi as an inner automorphism. And so H and N extensions are very useful in all kinds of aspects of the theory of discrete groups. Um, but it turns out for our proof, what we need is actually a slight variation on the um, concept of an HNN extension. So in the HNN extension, this additional generator implementing the inner automorphism has infinite order. And we found out that we needed a version where the additional generator has order two. So we throw in T squared to this subgroup we're quotienting by. And um, it, it so, so for the original HNN extension, it's pretty obvious, or at least it's been known since the 60s that H will always inject into the HNN extension. And we found that for this mod two version, it's not automatically true that H injects into the mod two HNN extension, but we were able to show that it does in the case that's relevant to us. Okay, so um, the proof of our theorem um, sort of has two parts to it. The first part is that we show that if you have a flexibly stable group and certain technical conditions on these data, so A and B are two subgroups, phi is an isomorphism from A to B, and these things satisfy, uh, oops, Sorry, did my screen share stop working? I see it, but, but uh, it looks a bit frozen. Oh, I'm glad that I didn't see it. Okay, sorry, there, I think it's back again. Um, okay, so um, yeah, so, so, so we have this thing H and A and B and phi. So A and B are two subgroups. Phi is an isomorphism from A to B. And we prove a general result saying that if these satisfy certain technical conditions, then the mod two HNN extension is, can't be so fake. And that this part of the argument is, is completely general. It doesn't use anything specific about PSLDZ. And then the second part is to show that PSLDZ does have subgroups with these required properties. And so, we need the condition that D is greater than five because um, this condition guarantees that PSL2 orbits in PSLD of, okay, so, so, so the statement I have here is maybe a little bit confusing. So, so we want to think about PSL5 of a finite field and in the upper left two by two corner, there's a, subgroup, which is a copy of PSL2 of the finite field. And what we're doing with D greater than five is it allows us to get certain bounds on the size of PSL2 of the finite field in terms of PSL5 of the finite field. And so PSL2Z is obviously very different from higher rank PSLs because it's virtually free. Um, and it doesn't have property T and there's lots of other different things, but we think that the result should probably work for PSL3Z. It's just the technical details of the argument needed D greater than or equal to five. I have a question. Uh, could sure. you, yeah. So uh, in the first, uh, this uh, first part, uh, if you assume that H is stable, could you relax a little bit these technical conditions on uh, A, B, H, which, uh, which are needed to conclude that uh, H and N is uh, not so fit? Um, I haven't investigated that. I don't know whether it would allow you to 
relax the conditions. Um, yeah, sorry, I'm, I, I, I haven't really thought about the answer to that question. Okay, thank you. Maybe later. Yeah, maybe later it'll become clear. Okay, so these are the technical conditions that we need on our subgroups. So um, we'll just kind of go through them one by one. So the idea behind this proof is that we want the subgroup A to be really large and we want the subgroup B to be really small. And we're going to try and conjugate a to B and show that this conjugacy between A and B can't show up in a finite approximation because it messes around with cardinality. So the idea is that H, so how do we want to think about this? So H will be PSL 5Z and A will be a very large free subgroup. In particular, we'll think of A as being profinitely dense. So A will be a free subgroup of SL, PSL5C, which sub surjects onto every finite index subgroup. So um, there exist such groups. So we have a free subgroup of PSL5C, which surjects onto every finite index subgroup. And, um, or sorry, yeah, yeah and surjects onto every finite index quotient. And so then we have this group B, which is really small. And so the first condition here is kind of trivially satisfied in the case we want, because we're going to pick A to be profinitely dense, and we're going to have that A surjects onto every finite index quotient. So AHK will be all of the double cosets of K. And then we need this automorphism, which maps A to B and whose square is the identity. So that's just what we're going to need to implement our mod to HNN extension. And then we have this third condition, which is really the key thing. It's saying that whenever we try and look at finite index quotients of this group, the cosets of A in that group are substantially large set, larger than the cosets of B. So when we have this um, proper finite index subgroup, we get this kind of expansion property where the subs the cosets of the large group are bigger than the cosets of the small group and obviously that's what we're going to try and contradict because we're going to try and force these cosets of a to be in bijection with these cosets of b coming from this conjugacy which lives in the group algebraically. And so if it lives in the group algebraically, then the idea is it should have to be represented in the Sophic approximations. And then we need property tau basically just as kind of a way to force infinitary things to happen at a finite level. So if we have these conditions, then the group I've been discussing where we do a mod two HNN extension is not going to be so uh, I'm, I'm Sorry. Bit, can you go back there a second? Uh, uh, where is, where, B mustn't be too small. Where, what's the condition on B? Uh, I mean, yeah, A is big. Yeah. B, so where, there, there must be a condition that's sort of Really, really, the only condition that's making B big is that it has to be isomorphic to A. Uh, okay. So it's just an algebraic condition that B is isomorphic to A, and, and then... That's right, true. Okay, so uh, just to jump, to not keep us in suspense, how are you going to choose B, roughly? B is a 
So, 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 so I'll, I'll, I'll tell uh, you. Uh, so, uh, can so, I, can I ask a little question for the sure. previous slide? Yeah. Uh, for, for the yeah so uh, uh, from your definition these technical conditions uh, is it, does it follow that your normal subgroup which you denoted n2 uh, contains a, a free subgroup um i don't know if n2 can, well so n2 is generated by all these words. Um, I don't know whether N2 contains a free subgroup. No, I, I, I'm not sure about that. Okay, okay. Yeah, so, so let me keep you out of suspense. So this is what we're going to okay. make our choices. So, so, so we're going to choose, um, so we, set A to be a profinitely dense rank four free subgroup. So A is large because it's profinitely dense and it surjects onto every finite quotient. And then we set B to be a finite index rank four subgroup in the upper left two by two corner. And so B is abstractly isomorphic to A, but it's somehow very small because it's living in the upper left two by two corner. And we implement this inner automorphism with our generator T, which makes A and B conjugate in this larger group. So we have that A and B are conjugate by this element with order two, which we're calling T. And so you can see I've drawn this just kind of high level picture here. You have the whole group H and then you have a very large subgroup A and you have a very small subgroup B and these things are conjugate. And obviously this picture doesn't work in a finite context because a conjugacy should be a bijection between A and B. And so the whole point of the proof is to show that if you have a sophic approximation to PSLD and you know that PSLD is flexibly stable, then you can force this picture to be reflected in a finitary stage and get a contradiction by saying that I should have a bijection between something really large and something really small. Okay, so what's the so that sounds good, right? So, so we have this huge group and we have this small group and we want to show that in a sophic approximation, they can't line up because they'd have to be conjugate with different sizes. So what's the sort of danger here? Well, I've drawn this picture with, uh, at, at the bottom here, which is supposed to represent sort of the sticking point, which tells us why we need the mod two construction. So these four large ovals are supposed to represent four pieces of a potential sophic approximation. And what we're trying to say is that we know that a surjects onto any finite index quotient. So each of the large ovals is A mod K, where K is a finite index subgroup. And each of the small ovals is a copy of B mod K, where K is a finite index subgroup. And the situation we're worried about that we're trying to avoid is that you have a lot of copies of A and they decrease in size, but there's still enough of them that you can map all these copies of B onto smaller copies of A with, and there's so many different copies that this still looks like they all line up in the end. So with the mod two construction, what we are able to do is we're able to avoid this situation 
where copies of B are getting mapped onto smaller copies of A. And we're saying, okay, you only have two copies of A. And so you can't be constantly pushing copies of B onto smaller copies of A. You just have a small copy of B trying to large line up with a large copy of A and it just doesn't work. Okay, so um, that's basically, I'll just go back to the, the slide with the technical conditions. So that's basically how the proof of the, the, this part works. You show that if you have all these technical conditions, then property tau is enough to force the cosets of A to be larger than the cosets of B. And in a finite level, that can't happen because they're supposed to be conjugate. OK, so now I'll, um, in these last few minutes, I'll say a little bit about how we construct these groups A and B. So um, we construct A and B in the following way. So as I mentioned before, we want A to be profinitely dense. So it surjects onto every finite index quotient. And then we want to identify PSL2Z with the image of the copy of SL2Z in the upper left corner. So um, both of these things were previously known to exist. So it was previously known that there are rank four profinitely dense free subgroups. And it was previously, well, you know, it's pretty well known that PSL2 has a finite index free group so every rank. And then the condition we needed to prove is that you can arrange A and B with these two properties so that the subgroup they generate is free of rank eight, because that's what will allow us to produce our automorphism that we need of order two between A and B. So um, it's kind of a general position argument. It's like, well, if you have two free subgroups and there's you don't have a good reason to think that they have relations, then they probably don't have relations. So what we need to do to prove that um, you can find these groups A and B is we start with just an arbitrary profinitely dense subgroup of PSL5Z. And then we keep conjugating it by appropriate elements so that we can look at certain, so what we want to focus on are what are called hyperbolic elements of SLDZ. And then in projective space, you have a nice geometry in terms of the way these elements act on projective space with they have an attracting line and a repelling hyperplane. And this is actually how the vast majority of arguments about free groups in SLD work is that you use the ping pong lemma um, based on the attracting lines and repelling hyperplanes. So abstractly, the ping pong lemma just involves actions on some set. But in this context, the set is um, an appropriately chosen uh, in projective space. And what we do when we prove the ping pong lemma is we just show that if you choose A and B appropriately, then the attracting lines are separated from the repelling hyperplanes in the way that you need them to be to show that there's no relations between these two, these things. So it was previously known that there are profinitely dense free groups. And what we needed to do to prove this lemma is just to show that 
you can find a profinitely dense free group which is somehow independent of this special copy in the upper left corner in the sense that there's no relation satisfied by these two things. And so once we have- uh, Peter, by the way, I, I, I just remember that I looked at your paper, I had the feeling that you walk too much for that. <laughs> We look. I'll be sense. honest. We also have that feeling. We, uh, we were... as, as, so let 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 me call your attention to a little results which says that uh, if you take any uh, any any uh, any subgroup of S L N Z which is Zaritsky dense, right. then it then it is for finitely dense uh, up to finite index, and you don't really care about finite index here. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, ah, okay. so you, so you basically you could you, you uh, to get Zaritsky dance is trivial. So you could take yeah. any free group containing that B on a generator. You know, take take this B, take extra random four elements. You get Zaritsky dance, and then yeah, then you yeah. Uh, and then up to finite index. But I don't think you really care about the finite yeah, index. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That will will. Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll I'll look up that result because we also got the feeling that, you know, come on, this should be, why on earth should there be these relations, right? You just choose four random generators and why should they have relations? But yeah, we, we were annoyed. But, well, well, I have to be honest that uh, uh, um, here you quote something which is not trivial. You are, we are using uh, two things, a uh, vice fellow strong approximation plus the congruence of property because it's yeah it, 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 so on the yeah. other hand it's give you so much flexibility so i don't know yeah yeah i think okay. you can even uh, you can even uh, write explicitly uh, generators of these things of course if you take random yeah. it will work but you can even write yeah so uh, elements is... which are free yeah yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah well yeah i mean we, we, we were very annoyed at how long the proof of this went in our paper. Yeah. So, yeah, it's good to know that. Oh, actually, are... it's true. Gunnar uh, is, 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 a, is a paper which I think she built up uh, explicitly uh, free generators, free uh, uh, subgroup of SLNZ, which are dense. Yeah. Right. Take, so, so you, you can. Take explicitly. Uh, and I remember your paper. I saw it. Yeah. Yeah, because here you, you, yes, I agree, you work too much for this lemma, but also in this lemma, you say they exist. Yeah, what I'm saying, yeah, that yeah, actually yeah. You, can, you can really give, uh, yeah, explicit. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But, but using yeah. strong approximation, right, yeah. Yeah, yeah well, it, 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 I, I certainly appreciate more information about, you know, what, what exact, what, where that paper is that they construct these explicit groups. Okay, so um, that uh, that was my last slide. So um, if we can go back to any previous slide or if people have questions. Yeah, maybe you can, uh, uh, I'll be happy to, to hear a little bit more about the previous one because here, uh, actually go back for, for this second. I want, I, I will tell uh, Peter what Peter Sarnak asked before, basically, Oh, no, 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 the last one, the, the no, 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 another one. No, no, I mean, the, the last one of the talk. I mean, this kind of thing I'm, uh, uh, you basically uh, can do on, in almost any I rank lattice. You know, you basically take your B to be concentrated in a proper algebraic subgroup, and you take A to be uh, profinitely dense, and if you know the congruence of property, then it's not uh, it's not a problem to get this situation, and so you don't need to do it with S L N Z, and you can do it with some uh, uh, other other lattices. And who knows? It might be that actually that there's some lattices in periodically groups might be easier to handle than S L S L S L N Z for the stability. At least for them, we know to prove some stability for unitary group, which we don't know for SL, for yeah. SLNZ. Yeah. So yeah. The only the only thing we really used that's specific about 
SLNZ was just um, the fact that people know the orders of the maximal subgroups in SL of finite fields. But um, I, 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 I think that probably that's known for that's known yeah. for finite simple group Ashbacher and uh, yeah yeah and it's basically what you expect except of you exception which are now yeah a, a lot of people walked on that <laughs> yeah 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 I mean yeah. If, you, if you really uh, if you free if up to finite index there's no issue then of course what Alex is saying is true but you. you it seemed like you wanted to construct something which is profinitely dense in every quotient. No, but you say, no, it is profinitely dense in a specific finite index subgroup. And uh, from there on, for him? Okay. Uh, yeah, and from there on, you walk yeah, only in a finite that. index subgroup. He doesn't need SL, SLDZ. No, if you would okay. do it in, a, in a, some subgroup of finite index in SLDZ, be just as good. Uh, then, 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 of course, these are soft theorems. Yeah. Oh. Uh, but I have a question. Um, sure. It goes back to A implies B and why A might be true. So, can you actually formulate any statement about PSL or any of these uh, higher rank groups? Any combinatorial statement which uh, you believe is true, which implies the stable flexibility? Can you actually make a I mean, I think I know the group PSLDZ, you see. <laughs> Give me a but I don't know what flexibly stable means. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. Um, so you're saying that you have a, an approach. Can you, uh, do you have a statement about PSLDZ or any of these groups which is stronger uh, perhaps that is, is enough? Yeah, it's really at this point, we don't know very much about sophic approximations in general. So making statements about sophic approximations is hard and there are virtually no combinat like flexible stability is the first kind of combinatorial statement about sophic approximations, which has proved to be widely. No, no, right. So I'm, I'm not, I don't want to see the word sophic. Oh, I, and I don't want to see the word flexibly stable. I want to see something about PSLDZ, which is all right. Here's a statement about PS, a combinatorial statement. Well, uh, 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 Peter, as you are a loyal uh, a customer of our seminar, by now you know that this can be written as equation. Take a presentation yes. for the group gamma. Yes. Right. Yeah, that is a thing. Uh, right. Uh, testability. Okay. Yeah, this is the flexibility <laughs> really means that if you have an uh, no, but that's why I uh, that's why I'm not sure that SLDZ is the, is the is the most comfortable one because you see it might be there are some lattices for example the kind of lattices that we we used at the time uh, with the Uzi Bisha yeah, uh, uh, to get the Ramanujan Ramanujan uh, uh, complexes. They have a very symmetric set of equations of relation defining them, say the cartridge tiger type of lattices. If you take, so maybe if you take one of these, you know, uh, very symmetric set of equations, maybe it will be easier to handle them as equations rather than uh, handling SL5Z, um, which yeah. is so less, are less symmetric. The question is, are unipotents playing any role in anything? It seems not. Not really, as far as I can see. That's 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 not really. Yeah, the, the reason we focused on PSLZ is because um, our idea of why this should be true is closely connected to kind of geometric pictures about PSLR. But um, yeah, certainly, Oh really? Why? 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 Can you say in what sense? Uh, it's, uh, yeah. yeah. So you know, um, PSLR mod PSLZ or finite index subgroups, you know, has the interpretation in hyperbolic geometry, which is 
easy for Lewis and I to visualize. And Lewis and I aren't as experienced with visualizing geometries uh, that that are different from PSLR from quotients of PSLR. So 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 our, our our geometric approach to this was very much focused on visualizing quotients of PSLR and trying to understand things like the mean curvature flow, which could act to somehow edit out defects in the SOFIC approximation and show that you're perfectly flexi flexibly stable. Like the idea is that if you look at this geometrically, so it's it's maybe easier to see just in the context of surface groups. So, you know, a perfect SOFIC approximation to a surface group is just a, like a grid or well, octagons on the surface or whatever, right? It's just a tiling of the surface by the appropriate geometry. And then the defects are like little holes in the surface where you have parts of the grid that are missing or somehow screwed up. And what the idea is, is you want to kind of delete these parts where the discretization is messed up and then allow the manifold geometry to somehow recover them. And the idea is that if you do this correctly, it should do the editing procedure for you where it takes out the defects and turns them into actual homomorphisms. And the idea is that, you know, like a surface with these small boundary components where errors were deleted is a general SOFIC approximation. And then a surface with no boundary where the discretization works everywhere is a perfect SOFIC approximation. So the reason Lewis and I were focusing on PSLZ is because well, Lewis more than me, but Lewis really is very good at visualizing like quotients of PSLR and, you know, that was how our geometric approach was working. Okay, the, you go now. The, difference, the difference between uh, what Alex is, these division algebras and this, the local geometry is the same. The big difference is the cusps, is the quotient is compact or not compact. And uh, if you're going to do some analysis with curvature flow, it's just like super rigidity. At first, it was proved when you have unipotence. Then it was proved without. Then the best, the, the most uh, softest proof, so to speak, is uh, nonlinear harmonic maps, which is right. only proved in the case where you don't have cusps, because then it's easy. The analysis is easy. Otherwise, you have to understand the structure of the para of the cusp. So yeah. So so you're saying that maybe the context you were talking about earlier would the quotients would be compact. Yeah. No. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That that, is, yeah, that, that is interesting. <laughs> yeah. No, I'm sure you can get your condition for co-compact lattices. I mean, that's not. I don't think. You yeah. have to you have to choose them a little bit more careful, um, because you you maybe maybe it will be a problem if uh, if uh, d is prime because you have to take a division algebra, which has a proper subdivision algebra, but it's certainly yeah, well, we only need a single non-sophic group. Right, right, <laughs> right. Uh, if you do get into the analysis of of uh, curvature flow. I'm sure the compact quotient is probably favorable, but I don't think if one works, the other will work. It's just technical. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, that's good advice. Can you go, uh, Peter, uh, uh, Peter Borton, can you go to the, to the slide about the, the first stage of the proof and you can say a little bit more where exactly the expanders are coming to the game, this property tau? Yeah, that's um, so, so the way the expanders come into the game is like you have. Um, so I have this subgroup A, which is gigantic, right? And then so, so let's now let's thinking we're at the finite level and we're trying to get our contradiction from the fact that 
these finite images of A are conjugate to finite images of B. And what we need is we need to say, well, I need to rule out the possibility that A is covered by a whole bunch of disjoint copies of B, and I can cut up A into small pieces with removing few edges. So what I want to avoid is the fact that I, I want to have this giant subgroup A, which it, I can't split up into small pieces because I want this giant subgroup A to remain kind of highly connected so I can say that it doesn't match up with the smaller thing B. And if I had sort of efficient cuts in A, I could maybe cut A into pieces and say that the pieces of A are matching up with B. Um, but the expanding property ensures that I can't cut up this large thing A into small pieces, which will match up with B. Mm -hmm. If I needed to do that, I would have to remove too many edges and that would not work. Very nice. I, I want to call the attention of, of everyone, and especially you, Peter, Peter Sarnak now. I hope you, are, you, you, you listen, that you see this condition that A, A has property tau, this is exactly the super strong approximation. You know, you, you recognize this is exactly the, the old work of Bourguin and the Tau and uh, Bouillard and all this coming up into the game here. That's the... That's the yeah. This little, little innocent property really sits on a, on a lot of mathematics. I, yeah, I, we, I we, really appreciate that. Yeah. We, we didn't end up using as much of that stuff as exists, but we definitely spend a lot of time looking through these like more recent stuff of Bourdain and you know Briard and stuff about these finer finer versions of these properties. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, but it is uh, what started as a strange question of Alex Lubotsky, of whether yeah. you drop to infinite uh, to these risky dense non non lattice and still have property tau. Yeah, so it's nice to see it used. Yeah, yeah, many years ago. Uh, okay, uh, there, uh, 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 thank you very much. It was wonderful. Yeah, you're welcome. Yeah, but uh, I, I, I remember that there were some talks and there are some people which you promised to answer them toward the yeah, end. Yeah, yeah. Somebody wanted to know so, about these. Uh, we, we usually, we, we, we allow up to 75 minutes. So you can take your time and answer questions. And, uh, you know, maybe some people are not interested to continue. That's fine. But please go ahead. Uh, Michael, you wanted to ask about... Uh, uh, this uh, cones embedding, right? Yeah. Yeah, Peter, you had uh, this remark that there is a relation between the recent refutation and the, the your view of direct products. Yeah, so let me go up to the... So, yes, yeah, so, so the, the main place where that kind of comes in is this theorem of Iona that F2 times F2 is not flexibly stable. So, um, yeah, the, the, the philosophy I'm trying to communicate there is that direct products are really hard to construct finite models for if you're combining non so Somehow, like, non-commutativity and plus a direct product makes it very, very hard to construct finite models. So, um, Kahn's embedding conjecture is equivalent to the statement that finite dimensional representations are dense in the unitary dual of F times F2, F2 times F2. So, so, so I, I can explain in more detail what that means or are, are people comfortable with the unitary dual idea? Could you please repeat the sentence? So Kahn's embedding conjecture is equivalent to the statement that finite dimensional representations are dense in the unitary dual of this group, F2 times F2. Is this somehow more natural to think in terms of the QWEP conjecture, like Kirchspell conjecture, like involving um, F2? Yes, or... so, so the way I would think of, about it is, um, yeah, there's, so 
Kirchberg has this theorem that Kahn's embedding conjecture is equivalent to the maximal tensor product of C star F2 with itself is the same as the minimal tensor product of C star F2 with itself. And so density of finite dimensional representations in the unitary dual is um, something that allows you pretty easily to show that the two C star tensor products are the same. So um, this idea of studying finite models for F2 times F2 really um, has a lot to, to do with um, trying to understand the, the, the tensor product of C star F2 with itself. And so the idea of, um, so, so I would say this, so F2 times F2 has this question about flexible stability. And then there's another question about unitary stability, which we were discussing a little bit before. And so I think there's a close analog between ergodic theory and representation theory, which happens in both of these contexts. So F2 times F2 not being flexibly stable is like a ergodic theory thing. And then there's the unitary stability on the representation theory side. And it's not a direct analogy with flexible stability. It's just kind of an idea how somehow F2 times F2 seems to be a really, really crucial group in this area. And, you know, Kahn's embedding is this statement about finite area approximations for unitary reps of F2 times F2. And there's an ergodic theory statement about approximating F2 times F2 with models on sophic approximations. So sophic approximations are supposed to be models for the group. And then you can lift models for a group to models for actions of a group. And so Kahn's embedding conjecture and related issues are kind of have to do with building one level of structure on top of a sophic approximation where you're using this model for the group to model actions of the group. So, so bro broadly speaking, the point I'm trying to make is that F2 times F2 being extremely hard to find models, finite models for is something that appears in the representation theory context. And you can interpret the refutation of Kahn's embedding conjecture as a statement that it's hard to find finite models for F2 times F2. Cool. Alon, isn't it true that this group is stable with respect to the hilbert schmidt norm or something like that? Right? I don't think it's no. Johanna says he's, he, you know, I last asked Joanna last time, and he said he believes this that it is not flexibly, not flexibly Hilbert Schmidt state. I mean, he believes, but then he, he commented that it's not known. Okay. Any more questions? Yeah, the, I'll just say like so. Um, there's a notion of a hyperlinear group, and so. I guess that um, unitary stability would be something like approximating, transforming hyperlinear approximations to actual homomorphisms into finite dimensional unitary groups. And that's yeah. also related to Kahn's embedding conjecture. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, that's we heard, and we will hear many, much more on that in this seminar. Uh, if there are no, no questions, I just I want have, to... I have uh, the sorry. last, uh, yeah, because, because you did this remark. So now there is a natural question. Uh, can we, in your theorem, uh, like say, uh, flexibly unitary stable, and then uh, conclude that there exists a non-hyperlinear group of this form? Ah, that's a very interesting question. I... Um, 
Yeah, so, so, so just thinking at the highest level, I, you know, most of the aspects of the proof you could try to translate, I think. Um, I, I, I wouldn't promise that everything would go through, but I, I not, certainly not, think not so Not so easily, because you're really doing your kind of uh, the finiteness. Yeah, it's playing a I, role. You would have to turn cardinality into dimension somehow. Right. Like yeah. you would have to turn the cardinality arguments we're making into arguments about like the dimension of certain subspaces not matching up or something like that. Right. And how do you know this for uh, the representation? Maybe if you have a control on the representation, you might be. But uh, yeah. Could you please repeat the question? I think I haven't heard it. So I, I repeat uh, just, uh, uh, so take uh, the theorem and uh, change the hypothesis and change the conclusion. So the hypothesis, you add uh, flexibly Hilbert Schmidt stable with respect to normalized Hilbert Schmidt. Uh, yeah, so uh, mm -hmm. uh, stable flexibly, but for unitary uh, case. And uh, then the conclusion is it true that the whole proof actually can be adapted to have a conclusion that there exists a non-hyperlinear group mm -hmm. of this form, of, of this form, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, so as I said, you know, obviously cardinality arguments would have to turn into dimension arguments and whether or not that can be done would be the kind of the, the, the question of, uh, about whether it works. But what about, say, things like property tau? Yeah. Um, that's, that's... Maybe. Yeah, so, so I, I mean, we're using property tau for expand your graphs. I, I don't know whether there are representation theoretic and I, yeah, I mean, it's getting, it's getting kind of fuzzy in my mind how this would work because you need to have an analog of like a coset or something where you could say the cosets of A are somehow bigger than the cosets of B. You could ask, ah. Uh, you could ask for dimensions of certain in, in orbits, invariant yeah, subspaces you, you, to be you less. You need to ask about dimensions of invariant subspaces. Um, yeah, so, so, so you need kind of like an expander theorem about the dimensions of subspaces or something like that. There are some dimension expanders some people here invented, right? Uh, yeah, but it's not so. <laughs> uh, well, maybe. <laughs> I, I have a question about this HNN modular two. Sure. You you see because from what you are saying, it seems to be that there is no modular two, just finite. I mean any finite HNN extension, model of finite, any N works, not just two. Yes, that's absolutely right. Any, uh, any is, finite. But, but it doesn't, I mean, uh, it doesn't relax too much condition on this A, B and H or what? Why you don't use this? Um, it doesn't really relax the condition because we only have two groups, right? So we need to map the two group, we need to map A to B and with an element of finite order. So why not just mm. say it's an element of order two? I guess that's okay. what we were thinking. Okay. Like, you know, you have two free groups of rank four and you want an isomorph, or you want to map them between each other. We, we just thought that would be easier. Mm -hmm. I see. Is there a general criterion when uh, uh, in this H and N construction, if you make the automorphism, if you declare it to be a finite order, when you still have an injection of H? We weren't able to find this construction studied in the literature where you do an H and N extension with a element of finite order. Lewis came up with an example to show that it doesn't always work. Um, but 
I don't know any kind of general theorem about when it does. And, here, and when you prove it here that it does work, you, you, which properties of SLDZ you are using? Well, we we just use that where it's a free group of rank eight where we're switching the generators. Oh, so. I see. It's because of that. Okay. Ah, it's for the free group that you do. I see. Okay. If there are no more questions, then uh, uh, let me just mention that next week we are going to hear a, a talk exactly on a theorem which is now on the slide. Uh, Nir Lazarovich will talk about his interesting work with the Arya Levit and Yair Minsky showing the surface groups are flexible, stable. This is the program for next week, so it's just on time.